Well, hello, everybody. Good morning from London and a big welcome to our global audience. A special good evening to those tuning in from South Asia, the region that's the focus of our discussion today. My name is Rachel Marcus. I'm a senior research fellow in the gender equality and social inclusion team here at ODI. I'm delighted to introduce this conversation on behalf of the Align platform, which focuses on advancing learning and innovation on gender norms. We're very excited about this panel today, bursting with so much expertise and experience. Our guests are here to help us launch a new series of Align Digital Case Studies published today, which will now be shared in the chat to explore the question, can broadcast media help change gender norms? We can't let, wait to learn more from experiences across South Asia. But before we begin today's session, we'd love to hear from you. We're opening a poll which should be appearing on your screen now. The question we'd like you to answer is, what do you think the influence of broadcast media is on gender norms? Please make your selection now while we wait for the results to come through. I'll just say that we hope to foster plenty of exchange between today's audience and our wonderful speakers. So please use the Q&A box function below. If you'd like to speak directly to our guests, we'll ask you to signal that you'd like to open your mics so you can get involved or ask your question when we come to the Q&A segment. On Twitter, our handle is align underscore gender and it's being posted in the chat box, do tag us to, jo to join the conversation. So we have our poll results and we're pretty evenly split, you know, you know, between neutral, positive, negative and undecided. That is so interesting. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what the panelists have to say and seeing whether that changes by the end of the webinar. Also, before we go further, I wanted to mention that we have an automated closed caption function, which you can switch on via the CC button. It is automated, so apologies in advance for any errors. Um, finally, then, without further ado, and on behalf of Adline, I'm very pleased to introduce Faria Nasruddin. Faria is a scholar at Harvard University and an Align consultant. She has led the research and is author of our new Align case studies. So we'll now give a brief overview of what she found. Faria, over to you. Thanks, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here to share this new research. I'm Faria Nasruddin, and here at Align, we're interested in broadcast media because it can be a tool to shift gendered social norms and move towards gender equality. Broadcast media gives journalists and media decision makers the power to break down gender stereotypes, showcase positive role models, real or fictional, and open up more equal professional opportunities for women in the sector. Broadcast media has a clear impact on our attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, as reflected in my extensive literature review published on the Align platform. The majority of this research finds that today's media content is still mostly stereotyped, unrepresentative, and ultimately harmful to women and gender minorities. There has, however, been far less research on how broadcast media can, and in fact does, make a direct contribution to gender norm change and Align's latest series of case studies aims to help fill that research gap. These case studies build on the findings from a range of research showing how representation and, and role modeling help to promote egalitarian gender norms. They bring together voices from three key sectors in the media, the first being uh, education, entertainment, and development programming, the second being commercial and the entertainment sector, and the third being news media and journalism. Firstly, the case studies from edutainment explore the different methodologies used by development organizations to plan targeted broadcast drama series. Next, the case studies on the commercial entertainment sector review how non-governmental -govern organizations leverage their research to drive top-down change with content creators in Hollywood. And lastly, from the news media sector, we examine how journalists can improve their practices to produce news content that is both gender representative and gender sensitive and how data on the representation of women in the broadcast in broadcast media are used to change national legislation and policy. How women and men are depicted in the media has a profound effect on societal attitudes by reinforcing traditional gender roles. Thus, by exploring how key actors in broadcast media approach gender norm change and studying the impacts of their initiatives, these case studies are a contribution to knowledge on how to build better programs to counter harmful gender norms and ultimately to create a more gender just and equal world. 
So I'm sure that the audience today will find the case studies both relevant and interesting. And it was fascinating. It was fascinating work. It gave me a lot of hope for how we can accelerate change. We're putting the link to the aligned case studies in the chat again now. So please do have a read and let me know what you think. Now I'm delighted to be introducing our moderator for today's discussion, Amu Joseph. Amu is a leading author and journalist in India's media sector. She's a champion of gender equality and a trailblazing figure who helped found the network of women in media in India in 2002. Amu writes primarily on issues related to gender, human development, and the media itself. She's the author of multiple books, which overlap with our discussion today, and has supported the coordination of the Global Media Monitoring Project's research in India as well. We couldn't think of a better voice to lead our discussion today, so thank you, Amu, for sharing your time and insight with us. Off to you. Thank you, Faria. I'm happy to be part of this event. Thank you for inviting me to moderate this much needed conversation about the role of the media, especially the broadcast media in promoting gender equality, both within the media and in society. As most of you no doubt know, the global report of the, uh, of the Global Media Monitoring Project 2020 was launched in July, 2021. Sadly, it revealed that it may take at least another 67 years to close the average gender equality gap in traditional news media worldwide. No country or region in the world has so far achieved anywhere near gender equality in terms of people who appear as subjects and sources in news content. Another 2020 study on women and leadership in the news media conducted by the Reuters Institute at Oxford University which looked at 200 major online and offline news outlets in 10 different markets across four continents, found that only 23% of top editors were women. This was despite the fact that on average, 40% of journalists in all 10 markets taken together were women. Yet another recent study commissioned by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and conducted by AKAS Consulting involved five months of looking at trends in six English-speaking countries, including India. That exercise found that women comprise 39% of journalists, so pretty much the same as the earlier study, and just 26 of journalism leadership globally. They are gro grossly underrepresented in media coverage too, including news headlines. It is clear, therefore, that a lot of change is needed and no doubt the diverse panel put together by the Align team will help us figure out some ways in which change can be brought about. We will first hear from Gitiara Nasreen, who is based in Bangladesh and has had a long innings as the GMMP coordinator for Bangladesh, as well as the Asia region. A distinguished career has been professional as well as academic work in the media. She's a professor in the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism of the University of Dhaka. Thank you for joining us today, Geetiara. Could you please begin by telling us what the findings of the latest round of the GMMP conducted in 2020 reveal about women's representation in the news media, especially in the Asia region and South Asia if possible? Uh, in short, uh, actually, the sixth global uh, media monitoring was really extraordinary because of the COVID-19 situation. Yet, uh, despite the pandemic, the number of participating countries, media and stories monitor was the highest ever. GMMP 2020 was implemented in 116 countries. Among them, five countries were from South. For Asia, uh, there appears to be a slight upward movement in the proportion of women as sources and subjects in the news, notably in broadcast media, where it's still below the global average, overall presence of women in print, radio, and television news has increased from 14% in 2005 to 21% in 2020. More news on violence against women come to audience through television in Asia, way more 
than the global average. Women were spokesperson only in 15% of the news stories and experts in 18%. Another significant thing to ponder up is the gendered ageism in, is prevalent in broadcast media. The largest age category for women is 19 to 34 years, whereas men peak the visibility in Asia at 65 to 79 years. Only 80% of women were found actually in that category of uh, 65 and 79 years. And we, you don't really see very many women in broadcast media when they are above 50. Women are still recognized by their family status. 17% cases of women were identified by uh, the family status. The positive point I would see among this not very positive scenario is we find more women and reporters, reporters and presenters, that is 56% in television across Asia. The male reporters were 44%. Uh, Although we do not see any women reporter, as I said before, wherever 50. So there are very little positive signs from, uh, from our 20, 2005 report when it was started, but there is still a long way to go as I thought. Thank you, Kitiara. Um, it's quite difficult to summarize the GMMP in less than two minutes, but uh, it, would, uh, it would be great to hear from you now about how women are portrayed in popular programs in non-news sections of the broadcast media in Bangladesh particularly, say in talk shows and soap operas, for example? Um, in that case, I think Bangladesh should be very representative of South Asia, uh, because uh, you know, we, we don't see uh, women's uh, role uh, from very much changed from that uh, narrow and uh, stereotype portrayal uh, that, that we have always seen. Uh, see, with very few exceptions, women views and achievements are usually omitted uh, from the broadcast media. Women mostly appear in entertainment programs and are seriously underrepresented in talk shows and interviews as experts. The images of women in television dramatic programming, uh, popularly known as TV serials, are depicted in narrowly limited range of roles, which is quite underrepresentative of the wide spectrum of interests, concerns, and behaviors of women in contemporary Bangladesh society. The major occupation of the actresses in those, uh, in those serials are that of housewives, housemakers, and students. Uh, they are usually young, decorative, and over-emotional. Older women are superstitious and usually busy in conspiring against others. Uh, on a positive note, while digital divide exists, the fourth wave of feminism is pretty much created a silent change across the country while social media becoming an important aspect in the lives of women, especially uh, those who live in urban and uh, semi-urban areas and have access to internet and smartphones. So quite a few uh, portals now deal with women's issues, uh, pick up debates, and there are very strong digital network being built among women uh, that addresses issues that are particularly very much relevant to women, which we don't find in broadcast media. Thanks, Yadira, for sharing your insights. We look forward to hearing more from you in a little while. Um, I would now like to turn to Nidhi Suresh, who is a reporter with News Laundry, an on online platform that is known for keeping a critical eye on the media and in India. The recent lawsuits against them by broadcast companies suggest that their critiques hit home. Nidhi herself has primarily focused on reporting on gender violence, including the brutal gang rape and murder of a Dalit teenager in Hathras district in the northern state of Uttar Pradesh that made headlines across India in September 2020. Nidhi, do you think you could please tell us about your experiences 
while reporting from the ground about gender violence, including sexual violence, especially in terms of the media's role in helping to change gender norms. In other words, how do you think the media can contribute to transforming the social roles and rules and expectations that keep the prevailing patriarchal gender system intact? Yeah, so a couple of things, and I'm going to draw from largely my experience from reporting on the Hathras case. So to give a little bit of context of what the case is in case somebody doesn't know it, um, it in September 2020, a Dalit girl, a girl from an um, uh, underprivileged caste, was brutally gang raped by four men from the upper caste, from the more privileged caste. Uh, and, and then there was a whole system that uh, caused a lack of uh, delay in medical attention. Uh, there was poor investigation. The family was put through repeated. Uh, uh, they had to repeatedly explain what happened to multiple investigating teams. And after two weeks of receiving treatment, uh, the young girl died. And when she died, uh, the Uttar Pradesh government actually uh, went ahead and cremated her body. I, I actually don't even want to call it a cremation. It was a body burning without the consent of the family. Um, and then we, so we started reporting the case when she was in the hospital and it's been more than a year now. We just completed one year since her death uh, this September. Um, so my experience through this, uh, so I always, so I'm a young reporter and when I started out, I always thought reporting on gender violence meant going and reporting on the case that happened, uh, on the incident that happened. But what I've come to realize over the last one year especially is that reporting on gender violence uh, doesn't stop with reporting on the incident. So a lot of the times I feel like in newsrooms, we take pride in saying we report on gender violence, but a lot of times we are simply reporting on that extraordinary act of violence and not following up with what happens with that story. Um, and the follow up and when you start following up and when I started following up on the story, what I started to realize that it started becoming lesser and lesser about the story of this young woman, uh, because then matters go to court. And while the act of violence is an act against a woman, the story of the legal uh, system becomes a very male story because suddenly you're talking to the men of the family who are handling the case, you're talking to lawyers and advocates who are largely men and the voices of the women start taking a back seat, the voice of the mother starts taking a back seat, the voice of uh, the girls in the village start taking a back seat. And as a reporter, I have to consciously make an effort when I go there that I have to speak to the women in the village and I have to, uh, and it's also a conversation that has to go deeper because a lot of times on field, uh, women end up wanting to adopt the same narrative that the men are giving me. So then it, you, you have to find that moment to be able to sit down and have that conversation and really, because they do have things to say, there is fear and there is um, a lot of things that are different from the experience that a men in the village are having, of course. So I feel like as, and this is something that I have had the space to realize because I, 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 I take pride in the fact that I'm in a newsroom that has allowed me to follow up a case for so long, which itself I've been told by many colleagues is, is, a, is a massive opportunity and an advantage because in the fast paced world of news, uh, you simply report on an incident of violence and you say we've reported on gender violence. Uh, but of course the story doesn't end there. Yeah, so could you also briefly uh, share your thoughts on how gendered norms have mm. affected you as a media professional, especially when you go out into the field, etc., and how they affect the practice of journalism. How do you see the industry overcoming the limitations imposed by gender norms in the newsroom and in media content, with special reference to broadcast media? I mean, you mentioned that your own newsroom is different from the usual, yeah. but uh, if you could comment briefly on it. Yeah, so, it, but even in our newsroom, I have to be honest and say that a lot of times my editor is, is a male editor. Uh, and ultimately, even if I'm reporting a story and I'm a woman reporter doing the story, it takes a village to publish a story. It's never just the reporter. And, and a lot of times, a large part of this village is a very male 
uh, team that ends up going through your reports, who you have to justify a lot of things to. And sometimes there isn't enough time to uh, explain why you thought this was an important aspect of the story because your male editor suddenly doesn't have that lived experience all the time at this point to have that conversation. So I do think that if we had more women editors, if we had more women in uh, not just reporting, but also in in uh, roles like design uh, or elements of you know when we make a cover image, what kind of uh, what kind of design, what kind of symbols are we putting out? Uh, what really are we you know showing about the story? And on ground, I do feel like a lot of times things like, you know, when you reach out to sources who give you information, a lot of times sources are mostly men. Uh, a lot of times when you go on ground, you're uh, constantly talking to male sources. And when you're a reporter, uh, sources really matter in terms of which side of the story you are exposed to because you're of course when you go on ground you're going from a completely different place you're going to a new place very often a place that you don't understand a place you don't have a lived experience so the first point person ends up being the source that is that is there locally and most of the time it ends up being a man so you also then don't get access to a large side of the story so I feel it really isn't just about the newsroom changing, but there has to be a societal shift for us to be able to access certain stories. Um, and it isn't okay. enough for us to have uh, equal representation of women reporters as opposed to male reporters. There has to be, it has to go beyond that. Decision-making position. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, thank you, Nidhi, for sharing your experiences. We will, of course, come back to you for more insights soon. I will now turn to Rajan Parajuli, who is a journalist and also country director of the Population Media Center in Nepal. His work at the PMC seeks to build a world with, with equal rights for all by creating hit entertainment series that change lives. He works on critical projects aiming to motivate positive behaviors and normative change. Rajan, I understand you've contributed to the case studies put together by Faria too. Could you first share your thoughts on the gender norms that currently prevail in the broadcast media and how current content impacts people and their lives, especially in terms of the issues you have focused on in your projects? such as child marriage, girls' education, and gender-based violence. Thank you, Amu. Uh, when I was listening to, uh, listening to Gidiara, I was feeling that, oh, we share so much, so much, so much common content in, in, in the broadcasting world uh, between Bangladesh and in Nepal. You know? um, when you look at the content, uh, entertainment content in broadcast media, we can we can look at it at two levels. One, where men are protagonists, you know. If in, in any content where men are portrayed as protagonists, you will find that women are mostly portrayed as victims, sufferer, delicate, vulnerable, and helpless. So that, you know, all these men who are, who are playing the positive role there would come and help them. You know, protect them. Um, well, now, if you look at the mar audience market of South Asia, then uh, all of this, um, the private sectors, media industries have already understood and cannot avoid the fact that most of their audiences are women. So, uh, so things are slowly changing and women are, uh, are being tried to portray it in a positive way. But again, uh, in all of the different drama series, which are widely popular in South Asia, where uh, the women who are portrayed as successful are, are good housekeeper, maintains family life, makes husband, in-laws, children happy and satisfied, despite of her hectic, you know, and busy life in her profession. They're trying to show that, you know, that the good women are those women who can who can do good in public sphere, but can re do really good in private family, you know? Uh, and um, a girl, a young girl is portrayed as a good, who maintains family honor, saves her virginity before marriage, sacrifices her dreams and desires for her parents, listens to parents, maintains her family honor. 
So, so we uh, there is a there is an old concept of um, the good and bad uh, in terms of gender, men and women. When media constantly present these narratives in different format, from advertisement to news, from movies to series, parents ob obviously want their daughter to be like that, isn't it? When they see it's not, it's not happening, then what happens is they force them for marriage. And yeah, yeah. Um, I would like you to talk about your own work also. The PMC and you obviously see entertainment as a powerful tool that can bring about social change. Uh, could you elaborate on this a little bit? We don't have a lot of time with examples from some of the series you've worked on and any other good examples you'd like to flag for us. Um, so PMC definitely believes in power of entertainment and power of storytelling. We use serial drama as a major central tool of uh, entertainment education for social change with waving other communication and campaigning elements. Uh, a well-designed entertainment show can educate people as well as motivate them to apply positive behaviors in their life. But to achieve that, the entertainment in PMC's case we, we mostly use long running serial drama, has to be the replica of the society. It has to break that boundary you know, of, uh, of what is real and what is drama. When we actually bring the real life into the entertainment world, then people get hooked with that um, uh, drama, you know, and they, they hook with the character. When the, when the drama speak their stories, speak their language, and, and when they find the characters that they find in their family and in the community, in the drama, and, and then it, the characters they are in the drama motivate this, uh, this audience to try those um, decisions that are, that are actually being adapted into the drama in real life. And they can compare their uh, their life with the with the uh, with the life of the character, and they can they can try some. They can they can learn to be a failure, and they can they can see the see the good things happening in their life. That's how um, we we design our drama, and 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 our audience learn from the decisions taken by the characters. Yeah, thank you all for sharing your perspectives on the topic. Um, we will soon wel welcome the audience into the conversation. So um, audience, please do post questions in the question and answer box, Q&A box. Meanwhile, we will go ahead with some further interaction among the panelists, elaborating on points made earlier or picking up new conversation threads. Um, personally, at this point, I'd like to highlight the need to remember that while gender is, of course, a women's issue, it is not only a women's issue. There is no doubt that most existing gender systems are deeply hierarchical and privilege that which is male or masculine over that which is female or feminine. However, even though much work on gender norms has rightly direct, been directed towards promoting women's rights and well-being, I believe it is important to recognize that dominant norms of masculinity can result in harm for both men and women. And of course, it's necessary to move beyond gender binaries and recognize that gender and gender inequality, injustice, et cetera, are not only about women and men, but also about those who identify as transgender, intersex, asexual, non-binary, and or gender fluid. Um, incidentally, I, I would like to mention that the Network of Women in Media India is currently in the process of completing a study of, titled man, male, masculinities, and the media. So with that little disruptive intervention, I would like to invite Gitiara, Nidhi, and Rajan to please feel free to share any experiences, observations, or perspectives that they haven't had time to get into so far, especially any that will move us closer to a better understanding of if and how broadcast media can and must strive to change gender norms. Um, I do have a few questions that you might like to think about. Uh, one is, of course, we want to uh, um, talk about what needs to be done to ensure gender equality on and off screen. Um, I would also be very interested in hearing from you about how you think social media are influencing media agendas, including the broadcast media. 
and whether you see this as a positive or negative trend in terms of gender norms. And, um, <clears throat> and also, uh, would it, if any of you would like to comment on whether or not the Me Too phenomenon has had any impact on the media, especially in terms of changing gender norms. So those are three questions that I'm just throwing out there in case, they are, in case you're interested in uh, exploring that. But uh, Geeti Ara, maybe you could go first. Um, Geeti Ara? I think you're muted. I can't hear you. Can everybody else hear her? Because I can't. Um, we'll just go to Nidhi, if you could unmute, we'll come to you first. Yeah, I, it, I was wondering, Amo, if we could uh, maybe pick out one question so that I can maybe respond to one okay, of those. Nidhi, actually, I, I had a particular question for you because, yeah. you know, there is uh, quite a lot of evidence on, on the gendered impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on many aspects of life. Yeah. Uh, 2020 study, in fact, uh, uh, revealed that the media could have done more to seek out and amplify the voices of women and other marginalized genders and communities as protagonist sources, as well as experts. Do you think more inclusive gender perspectives in news coverage, uh, which, you know, especially if it's not only gender violence and uh, very specific issues like that, but something like the pandemic, do you think a gender perspective would help change gender norms? Yeah, I definitely think so, especially, I mean, pandemic is one, but I think that unless uh, the story is seen as a gendered story. A lot of times uh, we actually don't reach out to a woman on field unless it's like a sexual violence or a, or a domestic case of domestic violence or something very particularly related to women. Um, and we had, we had also done a study of how many women get quoted in stories. And this, the, the results were quite alarming that a lot of the times in, in, especially when it's a large crisis like the pandemic, uh, we take our mics and run to the men uh, because there is this innate understanding that they will be able to articulate it better, that they will be able to tell the story better, that they're more collected. Uh, and, and we also have ideas of how we would want to see uh, uh, grief on screen and how we want to uh, understand what is happening. Um, and we don't want to see uh, the way, say, grief plays out on screen with, with regards to certain topics. Um, yeah, and also and, sometimes women are more accessible also. I mean, men are more accessible. Absolutely, yeah, especially like... Yeah, and they're running around, they're going to the hospitals. So, and, and as a journalist, you then, especially with the time limit that you have, you end up running to the first person that you see. And unfortunately, yeah. a lot of times in public space, you see men and then they become. So I think stopped. we'll carry on, uh, uh, bring in Rajan now because we're kind of running out of time. Rajan, what would you like to um, elaborate on at this point? Either something that you wanted to say and didn't haven't yet had a chance to do or would you like to answer the question on social media or um, what can be done to ensure um, gender equality um well the first thing that i see is that you know the most of this uh, the, uh, the the professionals who work in entertainment field um have a feeling that they, they have a fear to include uh, the educational content into the entertainment scene. Uh, um, um, you know, they have a fear that that will ruin their content, the power of content, you know, that will ruin the entertainment value of the content, which is not entirely true, you know. Um, entertainment um, can be used for the social change. If you don't have another, you know, if, if you don't use it for the change, then it will remain as entertainment. People laugh and forget, 
you know. But if you, if you are reaching out to the larger audience, which has been living with certain problems, gender, social norms, which is which is deeply um, rooted into the society, if 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 the same platform can be used both as entertaining and educational, why not? Um, and now all this entertainment education world is it, the approach is being led by the development organizations. But when entertainment industry join hand with the development organization, or entertainment industry also join hand for the for this uh, uh, social change using entertainment as major tool, then you know the, the whole movement will will go faster. Improvement will will go rapidly. That's what I think. Thank you. Gitiara, are you ready now with your mic on? Uh, Gitiara had to drop out. She was struggling with connection. Hopefully she'll rejoin us oh. for the uh, Q&A segment, um, okay. which we can go to now. Yeah. Okay, after this engaging conversation, I'm sure our audience is keen to join the discussion. So I'd like to now open up the session uh, to them. Please use the, as we said before, please use the Q&A box to address questions to one or more panelists. And I'm also told by the organizers that if anyone in the audience would like to speak, obviously briefly and to the point to ensure maximum audience participation, they can just raise a digital hand so that the facilitators can open their mics. So um, do we have the questions? Okay, the first question, um, it doesn't seem to be addressed to any one person, so any of the panelists can take it. How can we shift the power in broadcast media or mainstream media in general? which is being uh, held by those who are privileged. Um, Rajan, would you like to take that? Um, sure. Um, sure. Yes, yeah, sure. You know, it, it has to be done, in my opinion, it has, it has to be done at two levels. One, you know, um, that we have to reach out to the people, you know, who we'd like to change and work with them. You know, when we reach out to them, understand them, in, engage them in, in the overall this change process, then actually we empower them to to uh, to be to be in, uh, engaged in the, in the in the media activities in the whole production and broadcasting process. That's how we build up the team. You know. The, uh, until and unless the, the, the media doesn't reflect the society, it doesn't, it, it uses the power to change the society. So, uh, 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 and the more we uh, go to the grassroots and work with the grassroots and engage the grassroots people, the, the decentralization of power automatically comes and, uh, and, the, uh, and, the, and the media will be more, more diverse, I believe. Yeah. So now we have an, a second question for Nidhi. Um, how, how can broadcast media support and strengthen intersectional feminist movement at the country level as well as at the regional level? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question because I feel like it's something that I confronted again while uh, reporting on this case because while we reported on the Hathras incident, it was an incident that happened to a young Dalit uh, woman. And I am not uh, a, a, Dalit, a Dalit and I don't have the experience of being a Dalit. It, it was something I was acutely aware of uh, that this, and it's a conversation that happened across the country and keeps coming up that this was not uh, an act of caste violence, but it was only an act of gender violence. And the understanding that this incident is an act of gender violence and it's added, the violence becomes multifold because it's also an act of caste violence. The perpetrators obviously believe that they can get away with it. Um, and the experience of it is also multifold because currently the family um, experiences uh, a larger sense of violence and isolation because of the caste they come from. Um, and now I was constantly worried, how do I 
tell this story. There must be things I'm missing because I, of course, don't have this experience. I don't live in that area. It's not a language. Like Hindi is not my mother tongue. So maybe there's things that I'm losing in translation. Um, and we were trying to put together a, a podcast where we could have more uh, Dalit reporters come in and talk to us about what it would be like to report. And that's when we really realized uh, this story itself, this one story, we struggled to find uh, a, a, a Dalit woman or a Dalit man who had reported on this story uh, and just went to show that we don't have enough representation. So while we continue to comment about how we have to keep increasing reportage uh, of caste, we're not really turning around and looking at whether the newsroom reflects enough inclusivity. Um, no, in and fact, we know, we know that it does not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think the only solution is to really make that space. I mean, there, there really is no two ways about it. We have to just uh, take a step back and make space for them. Yeah, I think uh, some amount of uh, efforts are being made, but I don't think uh, they're uh, enough. And they're mostly by the smaller organizations and not necessarily by the big ones where yeah. it can actually make a difference. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Gitiara, there's a question. Um, I, I think you've rejoined, right? Yes. Okay, uh, there was a glitch and I could come back, couldn't hear what went on between. So, um, okay. anyway, now just in time, there's a question for you. Um, how can academic research institutions that work on gender issues improve dissemination in broadcast media? This is a very important thing. The connection between academia and media has always been an issue. Yes. Uh, well, uh, there, there should be, I do believe, because we have been living in patriarchal societies for years now. So uh, no knowledge about changing the situation is uh, automatic. We do have to make an effort. So, you know, we do un to, to understand the problems and to understand the situation. And we highly believe that there should be courses at, at the university level as well as, as the institutions that, that we call, I mean, in the, uh, for the journalism departments and the communication departments. Apart from research, I mean, we do this, uh, I mean, since, uh, you know, there are research that are going on, there should be more. But I think uh, it is time that uh, the gender sensitive education uh, should be included, integrated in, in media studies and journalism department. In Bangladesh, we have started that. We, in, in most of the journalism department, we have uh, uh, gender and media courses now, as well as in uh, women and gender studies department. And we, we, uh, we had done uh, research uh, in South Asia through uh, SWAN through South Asian Women's Network, and we, we haven't found that uh, the women and media courses or gender and media courses are running in, in other countries. So I think there should be uh, a very, um, you know, uh, an effort should be taken uh, to introduce such courses. Along with, uh, along with the, the media uh, literacy courses that that we always say that media literacy courses should be at the at the community level. Even it can be started from from the schools. In many yeah. countries of the world, actually do that. Uh, actually, um, there are courses on. I mean, I, in fact, I taught one uh, at the beginning of the millennium um, at a journalism school on covering gender. And I think increasingly more hmm. uh, they at least have lectures on them, if not a whole course. Um, but it's also a question of academics' attitudes to the media and mm -hmm. their unwillingness to share with the media sometimes. So I think it's, it's, a, it's not a question of only educating the media people, but also academics, uh, you know, being a little more accessible. And, uh, you know, uh, so that is another issue, I think. Um, now we have another question for uh, Rajan. How do you make the argument uh, or convince entertainment producers and writers that education can be a valuable component for their programming? It's 
This is right up your street, Rajan. Uh, thank you for the question. Of course, this is not an uh, not not an easy path. Uh, it takes a lot of time. But you know, from my experience, what I can say is that whenever you go to this uh, the, the entertainment world, you will find that they, are, they they mostly care about the rating. How many people are actually watching it? How many people are actually listening to it? But to convince them, we have to go at slightly deeper than just listenership and viewership. What are the impacts of the program? What, are, what how it has affected the behaviors, attitude and knowledge. And when we start measuring that, then all these entertainment contents will be exposed if they are they are doing bad in terms of changing behaviors that will come uh, in a surface as evidence or there, are, there, there might be a lot of entertainment content which are purely produced to, to entertain people but are really you know, doing some positive impact in the society, you know? It has to be researched, it has to be evaluated and those evaluation has to be shared and discussed then I think all these people who are working in the entertainment field, they, they also want to have some purpose in their life to impact millions and you know, thousands and hundreds of people. If they get the chance, why not? But I think there's a lack of evidence to share. There's a lack of enthusiasm to look at that evidence, which, would, which, would, which, which can help, I think. Thank you. Um, now there's a question for Nidhi again. How can we use the media to make the people who are opposed to gender equality listen? For example, if we post a tweet using the hashtag stop sexism, those with sexist views will probably not pay attention to it. Only the people who are already aligned to the statement of stop sexism. So in other words, how do we uh, uh, you know, avoid preaching to the converted and reach out to more people who uh, may not share our views, but need to be persuaded. I think the responsibility also lies with uh, how we do our journalism. Like a lot of times, if I am uh, reporting a story on uh, domestic violence or say even sexual violence or it could be uh, small patriarchal norms in a workplace and I'm doing a story on it. Uh, it also matters who I'm reaching out to uh, for a quote. Uh, a lot of times as a reporter then your own biases kick in and you reach out to people who you think uh, are saying the things you want to hear. Uh, but I do think the more we reach out to people we may not agree with but can actually form a discussion and move forward a discussion is when we will also be able to do have an audience that 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 is diverse and varied and can actually engage because I personally feel that if you have the same people who you agree with in the same room and have the same conversation it's also the people who agree with you who are going to listen uh, because you're also then cancelling out uh, a section because you simply have lost the ability to have that conversation uh, and I personally don't think that sort of cancel culture is going to get us anywhere, uh, really. And it's simply only an only conversation and dialogue that can really get us. So I also think only when we start having uh, people we may not agree with in our conversations, in our reports, uh, and questioning them, not giving space to... Uh, to say what they want to say. Like a lot of times when we're reporting on, say, uh, violence by the right wing, violence by uh, groups like Pajarangal, we've also received comments and we go and interview them. We've received comments that, you know, why are you giving them space to uh, uh, further their violent ideology? Um, but, the, but the thing is, they are, not, they are no longer the fringe. Uh, they are the mainstream and they are having a conversation uh, and they're holding dialogues in spaces that we are not uh, part of. So the only way to bridge that gap, I personally feel, is to really start engaging and building a conversation. Um, and I, I think that's the only way also then to reach out to an audience, uh, which will not just be an echo chamber. So any more, um, oh, so there's a final question um, for all speakers. Do you think the Me Too phenomenon has had an impact on the media, especially in terms of changing gender norms? 
how can we accelerate progress from this point? I also had this question, so I'm very glad somebody in the audience has asked it. I have a very short answer, not in Bangladesh. Oh, really? Well, um, I, I think, you know, uh, there's all, we have been talking about different hashtags and how people unite to share their voices. Well, communication has impact at different layers. If you say like, um, we really want to change the, uh, the, the people who are actually the perpetrator of violence, maybe that, uh, that did not help, but it helped a lot of uh, people who have been suffering from this uh, sexual violence to, 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 to see that people are, there are many people are there who have, who have faced the similar problems and they, 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 that give voice to them to be united, to share their stories. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it was impactful and have, um, have given some confidence to, to, to a lot of people in Nepal, I think. Mm -hmm. I agree with Rajat. My only thing is in the newsroom, sometimes I do feel uh, like the reaction has been too full to me too. One, um, men, see, men seem to have gotten very cautious and, and like careful of what they're saying, which I think is a great thing. But sometimes I feel it's coming from a misplaced, uh, from a sense of not wanting to get into trouble and not really understanding uh, why it is problematic. Like they're not putting in the work to really understand why this make, they, like something they say would make a woman feel uncomfortable, but they don't say it because they don't want to get into trouble. Um, and that really does, like it kind of loses its point because after a point, if the Me Too movement loses steam, it, like, and, and it's, it's a matter of time before he might just make someone uncomfortable. It might not be in a workplace. Um, so I don't know how deep rooted uh, some of the understanding of uh, the Me Too movement really is. Uh, although I think the very fact that they're cautious itself is, is good, uh, that itself is progress. Um, but then again, I wonder sometimes where the caution is really coming from. But wouldn't you say, uh, any of you can answer this, wouldn't you say that if, uh, it was covered pretty well, the movement? I mean, yeah. very, mu very much in terms of individual and the more well-known cases were covered more than cases that involve a lot of people, um, you know, people, working class people, people in factories and, you know, things like that. Um, it was more the sort of um, uh, well-known cases that got maximum coverage, uh, but there was some attention was brought to it. And don't you think that that may have uh, impacted society in terms of at least creating more awareness about the problem. Yeah, I'm 100%. I mean, I do think that there's uh, suddenly a whole new idea of what um, violence towards a woman could be and what it could mean, and that it's not merely an act where her body is completely brutalized, but there is uh, an emotional violence and that was suddenly that wasn't newsworthy till um, uh, the Me Too movement happened and I think all credit to the Me Too movement for understanding that and giving space to that layered sense of violence. Githiara you're still smiling uh, slightly skeptically um, so um, what about didn't wasn't there some indication in the GMMP that uh, was there any kind of change in terms of coverage of gender violence and especially yeah, sexual harassment? There are more news about, um, about sexual violence, but uh, the, the problem that we see, I mean, there are in Bangladesh, there were cases, uh, but actually it didn't work. I mean, no action was taken and uh, totally subsided. Uh, but the reason I think that the media industry uh, actually uh, doesn't have the, you know, uh, doesn't have the willingness to have like uh, the sexual harassment policy, uh, you know, policy against sexual harassment enacted. I don't know how many, I mean, other countries have that in, in your media houses. I mean, without uh, uh, a very well written, well laid uh, policy, and um, and I think the code, uh, policy framework and the code of conduct, the few spontaneous, you know, occurrences 
uh, don't really make very much of a, uh, you know, uh, wave uh, to change the whole situation. So I do believe that there should be, uh, should be policy, welfare and policy, which would cover like, uh, which would cover other things as well as uh, well, you know, totally written code of conduct, like, it, it also helped not into preventing such cases, but also for the awareness. I mean, what is just what Nidhi just said. I mean, sometimes there is a lack of understanding. I mean, it has to know for a lot of people that what actually make, uh, makes, uh, you know, uh, a, a sexual harassment or not. In Bangladesh, there is a high court rule uh, which was given like, uh, like a decade ago and which says that all media houses, educational institutions should have their, this, uh, you know, sexual harassment uh, policy enacted, but uh, we don't see very much of a, uh, you know, a result of that. And, and there should be not only, not only there should be policy and, uh, and you know, code of conduct, there should be also continuous monitoring that you know, yeah. of, of that policy, whether it's yeah. working, whether it's being abide by. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, I think we are beginning to run out of time. Um, so actually in India, also there's a sexual harassment law which says that it's not only about uh, punishing, or it's also about prevention through awareness raising. So, but the, that, uh, that part of it is not as uh, well, uh, understood by most organizations. Anyway, so thank you very much for your active participation, both the audience and the panelists. I'm afraid we have to wrap up at this point, but before we do, the poll is going to be opened up again to see if the audience has changed their minds after the discussion. The poll must have appeared on your screens. Please go ahead and share your answer. The question is, what do you think the influence of broadcast media is on gender norms? The options are neutral, positive, negative, undecided. Please do vote again. I'm afraid there's something, some technical glitch which doesn't allow me to see the poll results. So, um, shall we go on to the second poll question? So, a moment just to say that actually they have the the, the results have shifted a bit. So, they're mm -hmm. still fairly close, but more people now think that media has a positive contribution to make than was the case at the start of the the webinar. But also, more people are undecided. So, very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. And now there's a second poll question coming your way. What topics should be a top priority in any gender-focused broadcast media? The options are men, boys, and masculinities, gender-based violence, dignity and equality at work, reproductive rights, child marriage, or other. And Rachel, if you could, um, uh, you know, do the. Okay, so there's 40% um, said men, boys and masculinity, 27% gender based violence, 20% um, dignity and quality at work, nobody said reproductive rights and child marriage and other both 7% um, each. So very strong focus on, on masculinities, which is interesting. Really? And then also, of course, very much in tune with the work that, that Amo has been leading. So um, it will be great to for that to, to be out in the open and, to, and the impact that it will be making. So Amo, back to you then for, for client final closing. That is really interesting because I think that probably is the missing link, actually. I think women have changed a lot and uh, <laughs> a, a lot more needs to be done with men. 
But I hope men will lead that and not expect women to do that as well. Um, so that brings us to the end of this fascinating discussion, at least for now. And I think we've all learned a lot. I hope you think so too. Um, before we close, I would like to thank Githyara Nasreen, Nidhi Suresh and Rajan Parajuli for taking time out of their busy schedules to share their experiences and perspectives with us today. I would also like to thank Faria for her research and the Align platform for hosting this much needed discussion. And of course, last but not least, I would like to thank all of you in the audience for joining us today. Thanks in advance also to the listeners who will be joining us post event on Align SoundCloud or YouTube channels. I presume the link to that will be shared on in the chat uh, box. We know this has been a challenging couple of years for all of us, so we appreciate your sharing your time and thoughts with us today all the more. So over to you, Rachel. Amosa, thank you so much for your moderation of this really fascinating discussion. Um, a final word from us here at Align. Thank you so much to everybody who participated today, um, both the presenters for your, your amazing insights and the really great questions from the audience. Um, as I said, you can watch this event again on the ODI and Align website in the coming days or on YouTube. Please do share this content to keep the conversation going. Align is intended to be a space to share resources, knowledge and experience. And if you do have materials you'd like to share with us, please, please do be in touch and we can further the, the conversation around gender norms and their potential to, to shift um, within the media. Um, so finally, a big thank you to everyone for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of the week and we look forward to engaging with you in the future. Uh, thank you all and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.